Hey, everybody. Thank you for hanging tight with us just for a sec while we got everything ready in the background. Uh, welcome to the fourth episode of our Leafing Out webinar series, a webinar series to inspire care for trees put on by 1,000 Friends of Wisconsin. My name is Abe Lenach. I'm the community project director from 1,000 Friends and the host of the Leafing Out webinar series. If you're here for the Fruit Trees webinar with Paul Schwabe, then you are in the right place. Uh, and we'll get to Paul in a moment here. I just wanted to do a couple introductory remarks. Um, first of all, just with Zoom housekeeping, if we can, uh, our participants have do been doing awesome in our first three webinars, so thank you for that. But if you could mute yourselves or keep yourselves muted and then turn the uh, cameras off, uh, just to save bandwidth to make sure we can get Paul through to everybody. Um, that would be great. So thank you. And then a uh, note about the slides. We will be able to post Paul's uh, slides to the website. They'll be, you can get them from the general page, the 1000 Friends general page, which uh, Greg May, our, my colleague and technical assistance for today, will post it in the chat eventually. Uh, and then an update, we do have Lisa Johnson's webinar, um, her slides on pruning are up on the website now on her event page. And then Jay Weiss's slides from his Unique Tree Species uh, webinar are also up on uh, his event page. So go to, go to the uh, link uh, in the chat and you'll find those. We will have question and answer period at the end of the webinar. We should have a decent amount of time today. Uh, we have a recording for Paul's webinar. Uh, and Paul is with, here with us, but we, we recorded his uh, presentation beforehand and we'll do question and answer following that. But please ask questions throughout the webinar and we'll get to them. Uh, and then uh, I just wanted to thank a couple partners. Uh, as always, um, the Dane County Tree Board, we're working with them and uh, some of, part of their mission is to develop educational efforts on proper tree, tree management. And if you'd like to learn more about the tree board, they've helped me a lot schedule the, uh, the webinar. So I'm grateful for them and go to treeboard.org for more information. Uh, and then a couple, a few of our uh, dissemination partners. And then of course, the Wisconsin DNR, we're, we're thankful for a grant from the urban forestry program at the DNR to help put this webinar on. Uh, so thank you. And then another exciting announcement, we announced it last at our last webinar two weeks ago, uh, but we do have a tree giveaway associated with this webinar series. So we have bare root trees available. We have had people sign up, but there are still some available. So if you're interested, please sign up. Uh, the one quick note, uh, the trees will be available at the Dane County gravel bed. Uh, so you, you would have to be willing and able to pick the trees up yourself from Madison. Uh, and so either Dane County residents or anybody who's willing to drive to get a, a free tree from us. And we'll be picking up from the supplier on April 10th and uh, we will have a pickup day uh, following that, um, following our pickup from the supplier. So without uh, further ado, I'll introduce our uh, presenter for today, we have uh, Paul Schwabe from Johnson's Nursery. So Paul, thanks for being here. Thank you, glad to be here and glad you can all attend. Um, yeah, yeah, it's great to have you. So Paul, I just thought if you would share just a little bit about, you know, how long you've been at Johnson's Nursery and just kind of share a little introduction about, you know, what you know about trees and how you've, how you've gotten here. Sure, my interest in fruits began at age five, here I was in kindergarten, and my folks said, we're moving, selling the home, and you're going to go to a new school, because we bought a new lot out in the country, having a home built. Aren't we excited? I wasn't excited. I was terrified. So we go out in the trust Yellsmobile, and we drive over, look at this lot, and my father says, we have fruit trees. And here on the lot are four standard apple trees just dripping with fruit. And right then and there, I decided I don't have a problem moving because if you own fruit trees, how can life be bad? Well, we fast forward a few years and here we are in the front of the black and white TV and my, us kids would be peeling and cutting apples up so my mother could can applesauce. And of course, 
the apples weren't very good. They had a lot of worms in them. And after peeling and cutting a whole apple, I salvaged one slice. And I said to myself, this is bad. Why does homegrown fruit have to be bad? It's my goal in life to learn how to do better fruit growing. We need to know what to do and what the insects are and what we're going to do to get good fruit. So I ended up going to UW-Madison in horticulture, worked at a few orchards part-time in college, full-time after college. Uh, then I found out it was easier to make a living in ornamental horticulture, so I switched. Um, been at Johnson's 25 years, put down some deep roots, but I still grow fruit. I've got 23 tree hobby orchard and some grapevines, so I still enjoy growing and talking about fruit. Awesome. Yeah, it sounds like uh, your taste and your appetite for apples <laughs> really brought you, brought you to your current job and to your vocation. That, that's a pretty cool story. Uh, just a couple quick questions that I've been asking all of our presenters. So if you could share your favorite tree, and then I've got a tally going for uh, Team Coniferous versus Team Deciduous. So if you could share a favorite tree, which I think I know what it's going to be considering that story right there. Uh, and then uh, coniferous or deciduous. Apple and deciduous. <laughs> All right. That was probably, yeah, the, uh, we could probably guess that answer right away. And deciduous is running away with it. So I'm not sure how long <laughs> we'll be able to keep that question going because all of our presenters so far have chosen deciduous. I thought that would be more of a competition. Uh, anyways, um, Today, so like I said before, we have Paul's webinar, her, his presentation recorded. Uh, so I'll start that right now. Just a note, uh, at the beginning of the webinar, you'll see just Paul's glasses in his eyes. And eventually I asked him to move his uh, camera down and it, actually, it was actually perfect timing because his phone rang at the same time. So uh, there's a brief moment, about 30 seconds of that. Uh, during the web, just so you're not alarmed and nothing's wrong, uh, uh, that will come up. So without further ado, uh, Paul, we'll be back for questions after the, after we do the, the web, the presentation. Does that sound good? All right, let's do this. All right, enjoy. Hello, we'll get started with today's lecture. Glad to hear you're interested in fruit trees. It's a topic very dear to my heart. I grow a lot of them and hopefully I can share with you some information so you can be successful in growing them too. Before we get into specific fruit trees, there are certain cultural requirements that we should consider for growing any fruits. The first thing is site selection. We want a site that's well drained. If you have a site where the water stands in the spring for weeks on end or just doesn't drain well, it's not going to do well for fruit growing. You really need to have a well drained site. If you don't plant up on a berm or something, so you do have a well drained site. But if you don't do that, you're going to be have problems from the start. Another issue is sun. We really want full sun for fruit because full sun will give us the best color and flavor and sugar content of the fruit. Yes, we can grow fruit in part shade, but we really want as much sun as possible. And a big issue when you're siting your fruit trees in your yard is watch out for frost pockets. So in May, when our fruit trees are in bloom and the weatherman says, hey, we're gonna have a cold night, there's a frost warning out. Well, that's a real problem for anybody growing fruit because we could damage our flowers and not have a crop or have a light crop. If your tree is situated in the frost pocket, which is gonna be a low area, you're gonna have more damage than if you were in a higher area. What I mean by that is everybody remembers hot air balloons. You heat the air, the air rises and creates lift, but nobody remembers the opposite of that cold air sinks. So when you have low spots in your yard, that's where the cold air is going to be the worst on a frosty night in May. So we want to try and avoid planting in frost pockets if we can. Uh, pruning, another very important topic for successful fruit growing. 
and I don't have a lot of time in this lecture to really cover it. So we're going to say just a little bit about it. It's super important when and why we want to prune. We really want to prune in March, early April, or even February when the tree is dormant and the weather conditions are decent enough for us to get out into the yard to prune. And why do we want to prune? Well, we prune for several reasons. One is tree health, in case of fire blight damage or storm damage, we have cracked or broken branches. In that case, we want to prune any time of year. But the most important reason we prune is to create really an artificial form that the tree would never grow into on its own for better fruit. And by that, I mean, we want to prune so we have a loose open tree canopy. And that loose open canopy we want to, will allow us to increase airflow into the canopy. And the fast, better airflow we have after a rain, we want those foliage and fruits to dry out. If we have a very dense unpruned canopy, it stays wet in there for a long time. And the longer that fruit and leaves are wet, the better chance we have of disease problems. And with that light open canopy, we get more sunlight in the tree. And we already mentioned, we want full sun on our fruit for best fruit quality. So very important to prune. Regrettably, most people don't prune. If you go on YouTube, there's going to be a lot of really good videos put out by universities showing how to prune. But it's very important. Pollination, that's another issue. All fruits that we're going to grow need to be pollinated. Some fruits are self-pollinating. Some you have to have cross-pollination. So you really have to know by what tree you're planting, whether you need two trees, one tree. And we'll get into that a little bit in more detail. Most fruit trees are going to be insect pollinated primarily by bees. And another thing to consider is fertilization. I get this question all the time, you know, should we fertilize our fruit trees when and how? Well, yes, we should, but really only on young trees. We want to fertilize young fruit trees because the young tree isn't going to bear us much fruit. We want to get that young tree as big as possible in a short amount of time. A big tree can bear a lot of fruit, a little tree isn't. So our goal with a young tree is we'd like to get 24 inches of growth a year out of it. If we're not, we want to fertilize more. And if we're getting more than that, we want to fertilize less. So what you need to do in spring with your young fruit trees, usually around May 15th to, let's say June 5th, or May 10th, June 15th would be a great time. Fertilize your young fruit trees, either using a liquid or a granular fertilizer. Doesn't matter which one, both work. You only really have a couple of fruit trees, liquid is fine. If you have a lot of fruit trees, granular will be actually cheaper to use. If you're going to use granular, though, something like 10, 10, 10, spread it around a drip line of the tree and put it at the rate you might salt a good T-bone steak before you eat it. You don't want to overdo it with granular because granular fertilizer is a salt. Of course, the salt can burn the plant if it's too heavy. So what I need you to do is fertilize your trees in spring, then go back to them in October and September and go to the very tip of the branch and go down that branch. And what you'll see is the bark color will change. There'll be lighter bark and then you'll hit a kind of a lump or line, then you'll have darker bark after that. Right where that lump or line is, that starts the previous year's growth. Then you can measure how much growth you got that season. And again, our goal is 24 inches of growth. If you have less, fertilize more next year. If you have too much, fertilize less the following year. The plant will tell you, you just have to look. Do we fertilize old fruit trees? Well, usually not. Fertilization promotes vegetative growth, not fruit production. So there's no reason to fertilize an old tree that's already doing well and growing great fruit. So we don't need to. An exception on that would be if you're on sandy soil. Sandy soils don't hold nutrients. In that case, you really would have to fertilize about three times a season because the, the nitrogen won't be held in the sand. But for the most part, we only fertilize young fruit trees. 
want to get in today on apples because that's our best selling fruit crop and it's my favorite crop to grow. Apples, Malus domestica, they're in the rose family and they bear flowers and clusters of five. Now most of the many plants in the rose family do this, pears, apples, service berry, a whole bunch of things. Apples need to be cross pollinated to produce fruit. I always tell people this, you need to have two different apple varieties or a crab apple variety. And this creates confusion because I've had people say, oh, we'll take two Cortland trees. Well, no, it's gotta be two different varieties. Two Cortland trees aren't gonna work. The Cortland and the Macintosh are different, so they would work. Or you can use a crab apple as a pollinator. And I've had people say, sir, you don't understand. We wanna eat our apples. We don't wanna grow yucky crab apples. Well, if you have a Macintosh tree and it produces a flower, that flower is genetically Macintosh. It can only produce a Macintosh apple. If the flower is pollinated with a crab apple, the seed of that apple is a hybrid. It's half Macintosh, half crab apple, but that's okay. We don't eat the seed. We're only gonna eat the flesh of the apple. So a crab apple works great to pollinate an apple tree. It's not a problem. However, because apples seeds are never true to variety, that's why we can't grow uh, named apple varieties from seed. You can't go to a garden center and buy a package of Macintosh seed or Cortland seed, they'll never exist. Um, all apple seeds would be a hybrid. So we cannot reproduce a Macintosh tree from a seed. We would get an apple, but it, it'll be something else. An exception is triploid varieties for pollination. I just said you need two different apples to produce for them to cross pollinate. If you have a triploid, you need three to cross pollinate different varieties. The reason is the triploid variety is pollen sterile. There's not many of these on the market. We don't carry them. I'm only mentioning it because if you go to mail order, quite often they will have triploid varieties listed and they don't tell you that. You buy them, you'll wonder why one of your trees never bears fruit. Uh, a good example is John of Gold, which is a real common apple. And apples are mostly pollinated again by bees primarily and other insects. Hey, Paul. Oh, yes. yes. Good timing. <laughs> uh, can you move your camera down just a little bit? Because I can only see your, or is there any way you can get more into the camera? Oh, I oh, can move the screen. That's perfect. Right helps. there. That's perfect. Okay. Go ahead. So if we can't grow apple, apples true to variety from seed, how do we get another Portland or Macintosh tree? Well, it's real simple. We have to do it by asexual propagation. What we do is we take wood from the mother tree, attach it to a rootstock and have it grow into a whole new tree. And what we'll do is either budding or grafting, and there's not much difference between the two. Uh, grafting is normally done on dormant wood, budding is done during the active growing season. In this case, there's a picture of chip budding that I did late July. I took a piece of Cortland wood from a Cortland tree, I inserted it into this rootstock, taped it off to keep the moisture in. You can see the little opening there is where there's a Portland bud, which I didn't want to cover. Then after a couple of weeks, it'll all heal up. And this is what it looks like. You can see that dark patch of wood. That is the Cortland tissue. Now the following spring, we cut the top off the rootstock because we don't want to grow the rootstock. We want to grow the Cortland. And that Cortland bud will actually bud out and grow and it'll form a whole new Cortland apple tree. So all that tissue from the bud upward will be Cortland. Anything below that bud will be uh, rootstock tissue. But that's how we can now form new apple trees from named varieties. We have to do it asexually through grafting or budding. Speaking of rootstocks, that's a whole lecture in itself. But with growing apples, we have many, many rootstocks to choose from. This is just a sample. Um, commercially, it's very important. 
but for home growers, we tried to make it easy. So we'll actually divide it into three categories. Any rootstock that makes our tree grow full size with zero dwarfing, so it grows 20 to 30 feet tall, we'll call a standard rootstock. If the rootstock partially dwarfs our tree, so it grows, say, 14 to 18 feet tall, we'll call it a semi-dwarf rootstock. And if the rootstock really dwarfs the tree, so it only grows five to 10 feet tall, then we'll call that a dwarf apple rootstock. So normally when you go out and you buy your apple trees, you can get dwarf, semi-dwarf, or standard. Which rootstock you get in those categories can vary, but we try to make it simple for the homeowner. Now here's a shocking surprise. At Johnson's Nursery, we do not sell dwarf apple trees. Everybody asks for them, but we don't sell them. And there's a reason why. The problem with dwarf apple rootstocks, true dwarf root apple rootstocks, they have a very shallow and small root system. And this causes two problems. One, when it gets, the soil gets really dry, the root system isn't big enough, they can't take up enough water and they stress. Commercially, growers have to irrigate to compensate for this. Second issue is because of the small, shallow root system, they can't support themselves. And one of the primary purposes of a plant's roots is to hold the tree or plant upright. And in case of dwarf apple rootstocks, they can't. When the tree gets big enough and you get apples on it, the whole tree falls over. So as a commercial grower, they can deal with this because they actually stake each tree for the life of the tree or they grow it on a wire trellis. But at Johnson's, we feel semi-dwarf is really the better way to go for most home growers, so they don't have to worry about these issues. Well, here's an example of a semi-dwarf apple tree. And what we do is we grow ours on mauling seven rootstock and they will get about 12 to 14 feet tall with pruning. Um, fully freestanding, you don't have to stake them, you don't have to worry about watering them. Um, they do quite well for our area and that's what we offer our apples on walling seven rootstock. This is an example of apples on true dwarf rootstock at a commercial orchard. And as you can see, they're growing on a wire trellis for support. And if you look at the bottom of that picture, you'll see a black hose line, that's an irrigation line. Because remember, you have to keep these watered when it gets dry. So true dwarf apple rootstocks do have some problems as far as home growing goes. As much as we love apples, unfortunately, there's a lot of insects and diseases that bother apple trees. So if you're gonna have really good success, you have to do something to reduce insect and disease pressure. If you don't spray or bag or trap, unfortunately, this is what your crop will probably look like. While it's totally edible, it's not real appealing to many people. I grew up eating apples like that as a boy and my grandparents did too, because nobody sprayed back then or just sprayed little. So again, that's totally fine to eat these, just cut the bad spots out and maybe you're happy with that. But I think a lot of people would really have their apples look more like this. This is one that's sprayed in my orchard. So if you're gonna spray as an option for insect disease control, we gotta know when. And every state in the United States has a university that will put out a spray chart based on their area. And I've taken ours for Wisconsin. I've just kind of modified it to make it a little more simpler for everyone to understand. This is a copy of it here. And when you spray is actually based on the growth stages of the tree early in the season, then it goes to calendar days. We can't start with a calendar day right away because Trees don't leaf out the same day every year. They don't bloom the same day every year. It all goes by heat units. So to start out the chart, we go on growth stages. So on this chart here, when we get to the trees just leaf out, green tip stage, and the leaves are half an inch long, I like to spray in a fungicide only. At this time of year, we're prime, trying to prevent primary apple scab. And seven days later, spray again, fungicide only. 
again for apple scab control. Seven days later, spray again, fungicide only. And you do that up the petal full. And you, normally that's about two sprayings. Could be three sprayings on a cold spring. It could be maybe one spraying if it's a really hot spring. So we follow this up to petal fall. Once we get the petal fall stage, and which is defined as 75% or more of the petals have fallen off our tree, now we spray insecticide plus a fungicide because we now have fruit on the tree. So we want to protect it from insects. Seven days later, make another insecticide and fungicide spray and continue doing it every seven days to about mid-June. And again, that could take two sprayings, could take three sprayings. It just depends when petal fall was. Once we hit mid-June, you can make your spraying of insecticide and fungicide. And then after that, we start a summer schedule. We have less rain the rest of the season. We don't have plum curculio season is over. Primary apple scab is over. So we start spraying only every 14 days, all the way up to about mid-late August. It's a lot of springs. I, every year I do on my apples, probably 10, 11, 12 springs, and I get excellent results. But it is a lot of spring, but this calendar will tell you when the spray. You don't have to write all this down on the website for 1,000 friends. We did post all this information as a handout, so you can go back and get the handout for when the spray and also what the spray, which we'll come to next. But that's all on there in a beautiful colored handout. If you choose to spray, just read the directions on the chemicals you're using. Each one will tell you what safety precaution to take. Some will say just wear a long sleeve shirt and pants. Some will say wear goggles, but you gotta use your head as a chemical. So you wanna make sure you're appropriately dressed to safely spray. So what are we going to spray with if we choose this route? Well, here's that list I put together on some common home pesticides that work well for growing many different fruits. It's a long list. I'm not going to go through it all. Again, it's on the Thousand Friends website, but I will go through a few of them. Um, a really good fungicide used by many fruit growers commercially and home growing is Captan, the very first one. Captan 50, it's a powder. You can buy it online. You can buy it at Stein's Garden Center. We sell it at Johnson's. Works really, really well. As well as it works, it does wash off easily in rain and it doesn't control cedar apple rust. So in spring, when it's raining all the time in May, I like to use the next uh, one farther down called myclobutanil. It is also a fungicide that is very rain fast and it prevents cedar apple rust. And actually, I put them both together in May and early June. You don't have to, but commercially growers do. The two of them combined are dynamite. You will have beautiful clean fruits and leaves using those two products combined. They work really well. Normally I'll combine them till mid-June, then I just use Captan the rest of the season. But in spring, Myclo is a blessing because it's always raining. It seems like just when I spray, then it goes and rains the next day. Um, but there's other ones on this list, look them over. We'll talk about a few of them later. There's a few on here that are premixes. Um, they're very popular with home fruit growers because you get fungicide and insecticide combined. You don't have to buy two or more products. You can just buy one product. And while they work, the only problem is if you follow that spray chart, you cannot reuse a premix anytime you have flowers open or partly open on your fruit tree. Because if you do that, the insecticide in the mix will kill the bees. So that's the only drawback to using a premix. There's a bunch of them here. I've also listed some organic controls as well. Um, and again, there's more than what's on this list. These are just some of what's available to the home fruit grower. Some people don't wanna spray and I can certainly understand that. You don't have to. If you're only gonna grow one or two fruit trees, 
you can grow them in bags. Japanese have been doing this for many, many years and it works wonderful. You can buy pre-done bags. There's a site online from Clemson University called Clemson Fruit Bags. Um, they're actually a wax paper product. They last one year. Or you can use Ziploc sandwich bags. And there's a ton of these on YouTube. You can ask me for info later. But I actually make my Ziploc bags up watching TV. You flip them upside down. You cut the bottom corners off. You just want the tip of the corner. If you cut too much off, the insects get in. But you want water to drain out of the bag. And you cut a little strip in the middle of the zipper because you got to fit that around the stem. And I just throw them in a pail watching TV and I can make them all up. The next night I go out in the orchard and you, when the fruit is about as big as a dime around mid-June, you start bagging them up. Once you have it in the bag, it's protected against insects and diseases. Works really, really well. After about two weeks, the shine disappears, and then you can walk right past the bags. You hardly notice them. But I know a lot of home growers with two apple trees share and share alike, whatever. That way, it's up to your own time as to how much you want to do. And then we have traps too. This is actually an insect trap for uh, apple maggot. So you put this out in August and the maggots are attracted to it and they stick to the trap. There's also pheromone traps for coddling moth. There are some products on the market for trapping apple insects too. But the reality is you're gonna have to do bagging, trapping, spraying or something if you wanna get a really good apple crop. Unfortunately, there's a Lot of insect and disease pressure with apples. I just want to run through what some of these insects and diseases look like. I don't want to scare you. Um, they're not all bad every year, but in case you see it on your fruit, you know what it is. This first one is apple scab. It's a fungus. It'll attack the leaves and the fruit. The good thing is it's only cosmetic. It's only on the skin. If you peel or cut it off the apple, the flesh is fine underneath. This one is very common. I've never had it, luckily, but this is a cedar apple rust. It's fungal, and it's got a real complex disease cycle where it goes on junipers or eastern red cedar, it goes on hawthorns, and it goes on apples. And we'll get on the fruit and the leaves. This is a native insect, a snot weevil, it's called plum curculio. And it attacks a lot of fruit, not just plums. It's on apples, pears, peaches, cherries. So it does a lot of different fruits. Again, it's native, it comes out for about two weeks in June, two, two and a half weeks and it's gone. And initially at petal fall, this is a picture of a curculio. It'll actually feed on the little fruit and that's how we start spraying at petal fall really doesn't hurt the fruit at this stage too badly. You'll get a little scar where the feeding mark is. However, once your fruit gets about the size of an olive, the female curculio will cut a little crescent-shaped scar into the skin of the fruit and lay an egg. In the case of apples and pears, it's cosmetic. The fruit will grow so fast in June, crushes the egg, and we just get a scar on the fruit. Here's an apple early July. You see all those little crescent shaped marks. Each one is a scar from a plum curculio. If it's a stone fruit like peaches or plums or cherries, then it's a real problem because that egg will hatch and the larvae will destroy the fruit. This is an apple later in the season, close to getting ripe. That same curculio scars will expand as the fruit grows. You get these kind of ugly brown lumps. And again, it's cosmetic on apple. You can cut that off and the flesh is fine underneath. Coddling moths, we have two generations a year in Wisconsin. They fly at night and the eggs are laid 
And if you look in the center of that apple in the core, you see that little white grub? That is the larvae of a cuddling moth. What they do is they tunnel into your apple, right into the core, they eat the seeds out and they tunnel back out of the apple. It's the proverbial worm in the apple. And we get apple maggot, and it's primarily in August, mainly in August incident. They usually come in August, usually about two weeks every August, we have them real bad and then they're gone. Um, but the larvae of the maggot are real tiny. They'll actually dimple up your fruit real bad. And if you cut or bite into it, you see all these brown streaks. It's also called railroad worm. So again, this might be what you'll find on some of your apples. Just so you know what it is, there are others, but these are the main insects and diseases that we have issues with that we want to reduce pressure with so we can have a decent fruit crop. And people always ask me, well, if I'm going to grow apples in Wisconsin, what can we grow? Well, it's probably easier to say, what can't we grow? In Southern Wisconsin, we can grow most apple varieties. There's a few exceptions. We want to avoid any varieties that are really long season because they won't ripen off here. Um, due to the length of our growing season, certain long varieties like Rayburn, Wine Sap, Granny Smith, Most Fuji, uh, Rome Beauty, Gold Rush, and a few others would ripen so late they'd freeze on the tree before they fully ripen. Some years you might get a long enough season they'll make it, most years they won't, so I don't recommend them. On the other hand, if you're going to grow apples in central and southern Wisconsin, which you can successfully do, but it's a totally different growing scene. And I can't tell you how many people make the mistake of coming to Johnson's, buying apple trees, taking them away. And then next time I see them, they say, yeah, we hold them up north to our cabin up in, uh, up in Rhinelander and planted them. Well, I wish you would have asked us. We'd be glad to help you. But if you're going to do that, you have to remember it's colder in northern Wisconsin than southern Wisconsin. So you cannot grow apple varieties up there that are zone five. You need zone four varieties. And a few examples would be like Jonathan, Golden Delicious, Red Delicious, Gala. Uh, there's others, but they survive southern Wisconsin. They won't survive the winters very well in northern Wisconsin. So you got to make sure you get one that's hardy for that zone. The other issue is central and northern Wisconsin have a very much shorter length of their growing season. So you want to have a variety that ripens early or may not make it. So again, you have to choose accordingly if you want to be successful in central and northern Wisconsin. I'd be happy to help you out. You just have to ask. But please don't make that mistake. Wisconsin's a big state and the growing regions, the climatic zones do vary in Wisconsin. So keep that in mind. Here's a few shots of apples we can grow. And again, it's a lot of them, Zestar, Macintosh, Honeycrisp, whatever you plant. Our goal is we want you to be successful and have nice apples, whether you're going to spray, trap, or bag. But apples, again, near and dear to my heart, it's a crop I really love. Okay, the next crop I want to talk about is peaches. I think everybody loves peaches. Peaches, Prunus persica, they're self-pollinating. You don't need two different varieties like apples. That's good news if you have a small yard. Peaches only flower in previous year's growth. This is unlike apples. Apples actually flower on old wood. They set a fruit spur. So peaches are entirely different. Two limiting factors though on peaches. Flower buds are hardy to zero degrees. Colder than that, they start dying. Peach wood actually is killed or damaged when we hit 18 below or colder. Two very important statements there. This will tell you why Wisconsin is not a big peach growing region and probably never will be. 
And this will tell you that your chance of growing peaches successfully in northern and central Wisconsin are quite marginal. I know people doing it, but what they really hope to do is they hope they get two or three mild winters, the tree survives a couple of winters, produces a crop, and they get a cold winter and the tree is killed. If you're willing to do that, you'll get lucky now and then. And I have to say, even in southern Wisconsin, that was the case 40, 50 years ago. Due to global warming, that's not the case anymore in southern Wisconsin. That's one good thing about global warming is we're now having much better success growing peaches in southern Wisconsin. I've been growing peaches here for 20 years. And out of the 20 years in southern Wisconsin, I had one year where my peaches were killed. I had two years with little or no fruit because the flower buds got killed. The rest of the time I had beautiful crops. So your best luck will be in southern Wisconsin. Peaches are short lived. Even down south, commercially, they'll grow them for 10, 12 years and rip them out. The good news is they grow very fast. Um, to be successful in Wisconsin, though, we can only do the most cold hardy varieties. So 95% of the varieties in the world are worthless to us. We have to only grow the most cold hardy ones. And here's the best point of peaches. They are easier to grow than apples in southern Wisconsin. I say that because they don't have very many insects and disease problems this far north. They do down south. We're not a traditional peach growing area. Uh, five springs a year and I have beautiful peaches. So in many ways, it's easier to grow than apples. And nothing is better than tree ripened peaches. Peaches will have pink flowers. Um, some have dark flowers, some have light, depending on the variety. And the one thing with peaches, though, I do need you to thin them. If you're growing peaches, peaches are notorious for setting so many flowers that if you don't thin them, you won't have a good crop. You will get bushes, bushels of little golf ball sized peaches that are just horrible. They have to be thinned. So in mid June, most years I have to thin my peaches and you want to thin them to eight to 12 inches apart to get good fruit. And that's very important with peaches. If you do that, you'll have nice peach crop. But you have to do it. In some years, I can spend an hour on one tree and I'll take 75% of the crop off. That's an issue with peaches. They tend to overbear. Insects and wildlife damage. Um, if you're in an urban area, squirrels can sometimes be an issue. They like peaches, I think, as much as people. And Japanese beetles can damage peach leaves. They love peaches. It's really cosmetic. They'll hit your peach tree early mid-August, chew up the leaves a bit. It's not really going to hurt the tree, so don't panic. In fact, they'll bother cherries too and grapes as well. Plum curculio, we already talked about, but they do hit peaches in mid-June. Uh, curculio season is usually for about two weeks in June. And fungal issues, at least in Wisconsin for me, I don't have much, but the only really big one I have every year is peach leaf curl. It's a fungus and what it does is it damages the leaves, so all the leaves come out, they're all twisted and distorted and puckered and sometimes they have red on them. It doesn't really kill the tree, it does weaken it. The problem is if you have all your leaves on your tree twisted and distorted, Peaches never really size up well, so we do want to spray to prevent it. It's an easy one to spray for. One spraying a year will prevent peach leaf curl. You can spray with liquid copper. You can sp spray with chlorothalonil. Both are on that sheet of pesticides that I had available for you. Trick though is you need to spray in March. You have to spray peach leaf curl when the tree is totally dormant and before those blood scales even swell and crack. If you spray after that, it'll do no good because the fungus gets in that cracked bud scale and hides out in the meristem. All the spring you do, May and June, July, will never get rid of peach leaf curl. So you have to prevent it by spraying in March. Any day it's not windy and above 
freezing. It's a good time. Sometimes I go out and I have to walk around snow piles spraying my peach trees for peach leaf curl. Down south, they get a lot of brown rot of stone fruit, and I got to spray peaches with fungicide right up to harvest. In the 20 years I've grown peaches, I have never had that issue. Not to say you won't, so I'm including a shot of it. I've had it on plum and I've had it on cherry. But if you would get it on your peach, then you can spray captan up to like two days of harvest to prevent it. But again, I've never had it. But in case you have it, this is what it would look like. So again, growing peaches, we want the hardiest varieties only. I'm listing four of them here that do quite well for us. Reliance, Contender, Red Haven, and Veteran. I could have added Polly on that list. Polly is a white flesh peach from Iowa. They all ripen at different times. Reliance is early to mid-August. Uh, Red Haven is late August. Contender and Veteran are going to be mid-September. Reliance, super hardy, very soft. Doesn't ship well, it bruises easily, but it's wonderful for the home grower. Just love the flavor. Even if you thin it heavily, it never gets big, but the flavor is so good and it does so well here. I highly recommend it. Red Haven is actually my favorite. It's got huge peaches, really good flavor. It's probably the least hardy out of this listing. Some years I will have tip dye back on it when the others do not, but the quality is so good, I'm gonna list it. Contender came out of North Carolina, North Carolina, you would think being a southern variety would be no good here, and yet it's proven to be extremely cold hardy. It does quite well here. So there is success for southern Wisconsin, so much success. I know of three orchards, commercial orchards, now growing peaches in Wisconsin. That's amazing. But again, it's a crop I think you can grow here in southern Wisconsin um, if you take the right varieties. And when you do, you're going to get a ton of fruit. You won't know what to do with it all. You're going to be canning peaches, making peach jam, peach pie, peach cobbler. And if you have a peach tree and they're ripe, everybody's going to be your friend. You'll have no problem getting rid of the surplus. So give it a try. I think it's fantastic to grow. That's the end of what I can cover in our allotted time frame, because I do want to leave some time for questions and answers. Thank you. Well, thank you, Paul, for that uh, presentation. I think you made, at least you made me hungry with uh, the last comments about the peach cobbler and peach jams and all that good stuff. But it is just a good reminder of, you know, everything, just the complication behind planting uh, and growing apple and peach trees and fruits. So um, we do have, I'm going to share my screen just while we come up. Uh, we're ready for question and answers or questions from you all so Paul can answer them. Uh, if you want to throw any in the chat that you think of, we do have some that people sent in beforehand. I also want to, just while we have everybody here, I want to let you know about our other um, webinars coming up uh, Thursday, April 15th and Thursday, May 20th are the big ones. Um, I uh, just wanted to let everybody know about that. There, the registration is on our website. So let me pull up the questions we already have um, so far today. And Paul, do we have you back on to answer the questions? Yes, yep, I'm okay. here and ready to okay. go. Okay, awesome. So from Billy and Priscilla Wilson, my wife is at Apple Trees for the last eight years and they had never produced last year. We beat on the trunks with a stick hearing that this works. Is there any scientific evidence for this? They produced last year big time. There's more to the story, which might explain why it worked. And uh, they're wondering which one is right. They also did some heavy pruning uh, every year for two years uh, and caged the branches. Uh, or the branches have been, have been caged, so they pruned. So they're assuming that uh, the, open, the pruning did the trick, but do you know anything about beating trunks, is there any scientific evidence behind it working? 
Well, first I'll say it was not the pruning because then a young tree would prune. You could prune a young tree and get fruit instantly. And that doesn't happen. Pruning actually creates a lot of vegetative growth. So it was not the pruning, unfortunately, in this case. Beating the trunk with a stick, that's the first time I've heard of this. I can't recommend it because what size stick, how hard do we hit the tree and how long? Um, if anything happens from this trunk beating with a stick, it's gonna be because the tree is injured. And as we all know, stressed trees wanna produce seed. If we have a really bad drought year, like say in oaks and hickories, and the next year you'll go out and see after the drought, the year later, they're just thick with seed. And a lot of trees that stress do that. So maybe beating up with a, the trunk damaged your tree enough that it stressed it. But again, I, I'm hoping you didn't, don't wanna do that. Um, you also mentioned that you weighed down the branches. Um, there's a term for that. And I really think out of what you've told me that might be the main reason why you suddenly started getting a lot of fruit. It's called branch bending. And on that slide that we showed on dwarf apple trees on wire, that's called the, uh, previously that was a system that's called tall spindle. A lot of commercial orchards are using it. But what they do is branch bending because they plant those trees three to five feet apart. And the first year after from planting, they bend the branches down to horizontal or lower. And this causes a lot of fruit bud formation. In the second year, they're picking fruit. It really works. I've done this on three standard apple trees that I propagated and it was year six and year seven and year eight and I'm getting 10, 10 apples a tree. But if you go out late June, early July and actually tie the branch down or weigh it down so it's horizontal or lower, the following year when I did that, every branch I did was covered with fruit buds and flowered branches. I didn't do it on the same tree, had no fruit. So. Out of everything you've said, I would think that's the main issue. I do want to point out that you don't say, but some varieties are much slower to start bearing. If you're going to grow Northern Spy or Honeycrisp, they're both notoriously slow to start bearing. And the rootstock also, you didn't mention, but that makes a huge difference as to when your tree starts bearing. Dwarf trees tend to bear real early. Semi-dwarf are fast, but standards are the slowest. And even if we have it on a semi-dwarf, I know people in Minnesota have them on Molly Merton 111 with Honeycrisp. They wait eight years and they got five apples. Uh, 111 is somewhat slow to come in bearing. So a lot of different options as to why, but my best guess would be it's because you weighed the branches down and did branch bending. Sounds good. Thank you, Paul. That makes sense. It, it would be a surprise to me that beating the trunk would work, but you never know. Um, uh, Cecile, I see your comments in the chat. Uh, I'm going to get to a couple other questions and then if we have time, we'll get to your questions. Um, so from Joyce, uh, she asked, she said, we won an orchard of trees in a contest in Milwaukee to start an inner city community orchard on a city owned lot. Uh, one of their honey crisp, uh, apples died, unfortunately, and some are not doing as well as she thinks they should be. Um, Joyce said that they used fertilizer and mulch around the trees and, you know, cared for them faithfully. Uh, and was wondering if the, if the soil could be a problem, if maybe it's contaminated or uh, if you have any insight on potential other problems. Joyce, I think you're right. It sounds like a soil issue. Um, since it's an urban site, it could be an unmarked brown field, um, unknown. You could have heavy metal contamination. I don't know because I don't know what the leaves look like if they were full size or they're small, curled and burning. Um, it's a possibility. I'm gonna say more than likely though, I would want you to look at the site. I don't know what was there beforehand in the history of the site. And quite often you get these urban sites that are vacant, they were used for something else. The topsoil may have been all stripped off. You're trying to grow in subsoil. So dig a hole and if you have that dark layer of topsoil on the surface going down, hopefully you have at least three and a half inch. If you don't, you're not gonna grow anything. And hopefully you have five inch, but we'll hope for the best. But check if you got topsoil there first of all. The second issue is it 
could be compacted. If it was a former parking lot or business site, um, quite often the soil gets compacted through over the years and they might have paved over it. I don't know if they ripped the pavement off. Now they have it available for anyone to use. But if it's compacted, you're not going to get good water drainage and you're definitely not going to have good aeration. Roots need oxygen. And if that soil is a heavy clay and it's compacted, those roots aren't going anywhere. They're just going to circle around and around that hole you dug and they're never going to do well. So two other options to consider, but offhand, I can't tell you which of the three it truly is. Wish you luck on that though. I hope they turn out. Yeah. And does Johnson's nursery do any diagnostic work? Like if she were to reach back out, if she had pictures or. We or don't, you'd have to probably take leaf samples and have them tested to see if there's okay. any toxicities and send it in the plant path lab in Madison. Um, but it'd be interesting to know what the leaves did look like. You've been fertilizing and mulching and watering. It's gotta be a soil issue. Unfortunately, none of these three options are going to be really easy to rectify. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then we did have Lisa Johnson, who's an extension agent. So maybe look up the local extension agent too for help with some other methods for, um, you know, working on that problem. Joyce was also wondering uh, if when trees get uh, mowed over or, if, you know, uh, lawnmower hits the tree uh, and uh, the bark is chipped and clipped. How how can this be uh, ameliorated? If I can pronounce that word, how can they you know make this make the tree a little bit more healthy uh, if that does happen? Joyce, you had mentioned earlier the trees are mulched, but now you mentioned that they're getting whacked by the lawnmower blade. Um, I'm going to say the best thing to do is to extend your mulch ring out farther from the tree to prevent anyone getting too close to mechanically injure the tree. That'd be the easiest solution. Um, the problem is whether it's a lawnmower blade hitting the trunk or it's a weed whip or any type, type of a weed eater or whatever, or even if it's rabbits, moles or uh, mice in the winter chewing, all of this is girdling your trees. What's doing is it's damaging the cambium layer and the tree is either gonna die or it's gonna really slow the growth rate down. So we wanna prevent this damage. Um, but the big issue is you wanna increase that mulch ring around it to prevent any mechanical damage from continuing. If the trunk of the tree, if you look at the trunk of the tree and you see the damage and this damage is going over 50% of the circumference of the trunk, you're probably better off just to remove it and replant. If it's under 50%, the tree should be fine. It may slow its growth rate, but overall it'll still do okay. Um, the really only big option, and sometimes people say this, if it's eaten in the winter by rabbits and meadow voles, it'd be the same thing, would be bridge grafting. If you can do bridge grafting or find someone who would do bridge grafting. And bridge grafting, what we do is we take wood from previous season that's pencil thickness, cut it on an angle, and you, you want to actually bend it and you wanna attach part of it above the injured part of the tree, and then the other part goes below the injured part. It creates a bridge. You wanna remove the bark down the cambium and you actually wanna nail the ends in to hold them and wax over it. There's all kinds of YouTube stuff on bridge grafting. Um, I hope you don't have to go that route. I'm hoping you have enough undamaged trunk that if it's 50% or more undamaged, you'll be okay yet. But that's one reason why commercially we tend to use herbicides under the trees. We don't want any grass or weeds growing right up to it, sucking out the water and nutrients or letting us get too close with the lawnmower. And again, if you don't want to use herbicide for all you viewers out there, that's fine. Just mulch around the tree. It'll do the same thing. It's going to hold the moisture in, keep the weeds out, but it's going to keep that lawnmower blade away from the trunk doing any damage. Yeah, that makes sense. And it sounds like with, with apple trees and prune trees, YouTube is definitely another friend to, to keep close because <laughs> there's a lot of complicated uh, uh, methods for making sure you're getting apples and uh, peaches to share and to eat. Uh, and then let's see, we have Cecile had a comment saying that she has 26 mulberries and only a few are fruiting, but they're young and they 
seemed to die back. She did have a question. Uh, do you grow plums or wild cherries, Paul? And does Johnson's supply those? Johnson's does both. We do uh, plums, uh, fruiting plums. We also do the wild Native American plum too, because we do a lot of native plants in container. So if you want the native plum or you want selections of plum, we do offer, I believe, three different varieties this spring on plum trees. One is a prune plum, two are American Japanese hybrids. Awesome. And uh, Johnson's Nursery, Paul's coming to us from Menominee Falls, but it serves, can you uh, just share what areas Johnson serves? I mean, the whole state probably, but uh, just could you explain like tree delivery, just the tree purchasing process through Johnson's for folks if they're interested? Sure, it's over 600 acres. We actually have three locations. One is a garden center in Cedarburg called Johnson's Gardens and Johnson's Nursery Headquarters is in Maui Falls. Then we have a growing farm in Jackson where I'm at. But you can purchase trees by coming to Menominee Falls or the Cedarburg site. And we do offer delivery. There's a fee. We also offer installation. There's a fee for that. Um, but you can come down and view everything. You're, you're welcome to come and take a peek. Awesome. That sounds good. Well, I don't see any other questions. We're just over 1 o'clock. I uh, just want to remind everybody, there is a survey, evaluation survey for the webinar in the chat, if you have some time to fill that out. Uh, Paul, I just want to say thank you so much for, for coming today and for uh, doing your presentation, sharing about all your, you know, your many years of knowledge about apple trees and peach trees. So uh, thanks for being here and thanks everybody else for coming and for uh, attending Paul's webinar. If you have any other questions, feel free to, to reach out to us and we'll, we'll get you an answer. But Paul, take care. Everybody else, take care. And thanks for coming today. Thank you.